Good morning. morning. Welcome to Asbury United Methodist Church. Whether you're worshiping with us live here in person or worshiping with us online, we rejoice on this beautiful day where God has called us into his presence and unites us with his spirit. It is a day in which we remember those to whom he has given the greatest of all challenges, the greatest of all rewards, the most awesome of responsibilities, and the most awesome of joys, those of being a mother. So to all of you mothers out there, thank you for all you have done in the name of our Lord to carry on his message to the next generation. Um, Let's give the mothers a round of applause. All right, will you rise and join me in the call to worship? We have gathered in the presence of the God in whom every family in heaven and on earth receives its name. We come in the prayer of the peace of Christ and our relationships. We come in the prayer that the peace of God might permeate the life of the human family.
You may be seated. Our first reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 46, verses 3 to 4. Uh, God is comparing himself as the Almighty Father to the false gods and the false idols that were being worshipped by the other cultures of the time. He is expressing this, these feelings to his people Israel. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from your birth, carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he. Even when you turn gray, I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, and I will carry, and will save. The word of our Lord.
Our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. This is Jesus describing that love that will not let us go. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophet and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The words of our Lord. be seated. Mother's Day is also known in the United Methodist Church as Festival of the Christian Home. And it's a day certainly to honor mothers, but it's a day to strengthen relationships with mothers if we still have living mothers or If you are a mother, maybe strengthen relationships with your children. Also, just to strengthen family relationships in general. Many have had very positive experiences with mothers. Some haven't. Some mothers have had great experiences raising children, but that's not every mother's experience. What I'd like to focus on today is the love that God has for us that is like a mother's love for us, concept of God the Father. Certainly an important concept, but not the only concept of who God is. I want us to think a little bit beyond what we might be accustomed to thinking of perhaps the maternal side 
of God's love for us. Now, when we talk about God's nature, it is certainly quite expansive, and I think it's our propensity as people to project ourselves onto our understanding of God. I think that's a human thing to do. But what we always have to remember is that we're the ones that are created by God and God's image. So let's be careful that we don't recreate God in our image. Okay, turn it upside down so that we could have a truer understanding of God's nature. Back in the 1300s, the English anchoress, Julian of Norwich, sometimes you might see her name as Juliana of Norwich, she had a near-death experience in which Christ revealed himself to her as an unconditionally loving mother who continuously breaks herself open and pours herself out to her children, endlessly forgiving and enthusiastically adoring us. We'll see some scriptures today during this message that attest to Julian of Norwich's vision. But for now, let me just note that Julian also wrote a hymn that's in our faith. We sing hymn number 2050, Mothering God, You Gave Me Birth. Mothering God, You Gave Me Birth. In the bright morning of this world, creator, source of every breath, you are my rain, my wind, my sun. Mothering Christ, who took my form, offering me your food of light, grain of life and grape of love, your very body for my peace. Mothering spirit, nurturing one, in arms of patience, hold me close so that in faith I root and grow until I flower until I know. Julian of Norwich, 1300s. So my grandmother, Terwilliger, had hanging on her wall something that's based on this Jewish proverb, God could not be everywhere, so he created mothers. Now, let me point out immediately, I have a theological issue with the concept God could not be everywhere. God can be wherever God wants to be, all right? But this sells little things that grandmothers put on their walls. My grandmothers said God could not be everywhere, so he created grandmothers. And of course, my grandmother oblig obligingly put it up in, you know, to, uh, as a token of gratitude for the, whoever bought it for her at some point along the way. But I will say, between my grandma and my grandpa, it was from my grandmother that I was inspired to want to know God, not so much from my grandfather. Now, we all, whether we can articulate it or not, we all have a need to feel loved unconditionally, right? We we, we might mistakenly think of God who loves conditionally, like, oh, you messed up there, God's going to get you, right? And so there's, there's that tendency in us to make God like that in our minds, even though deep down we know God loves us unconditionally, we just don't often feel like love, God loves us unconditionally. But that is a deep-seated need we have, a, a need to be close to God as if we were in a womb or as if we were nursing at the breast. I wonder if the concept of God as male has been limiting to the point that the Catholic and Orthodox churches elevated Mary as the God-bearer, I just wonder. Open for discussion, right? I know Protestants will say, oh, they pray to Mary. It's like, and do you pray? Like, I always love how people criticize people 
who don't pray the way they think they should pray. It's like, do you pray yourself? So, I mean, it's just, it's something to think about, right? Have, have, has that uh, aspect of God who came from woman been elevated to, uh, to perhaps balance out our concept of God a little bit? Now, think about what Jesus did when he took a concept that was unclean, touching blood. Anybody who touches blood is unclean. Half the human population is unclean once a month during their cycle, right? So how does that feel if that's constantly reinforced in you every month? Unclean, 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 right? What does that do to your psyche? And what did Jesus do with blood being unclean? Flip-flop it. This is my blood shed for you. Turned it into something holy, something cleansing, something sanctifying, and in the process affirmed the divine image in women who every month were told, you're unclean. The passage Andrea read from Luke, Jesus says, How long, Jerusalem, have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Now, Jesus could have said, could have said, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a rooster protects his chicks. That's not what roosters do, right? Roosters are interested in all the other chicks, right? That's why you only have a couple roosters and all the hens, because it's the hens that gather the chicks and do the nurturing, and that's what Jesus was saying to a community that sought to kill him. That is unconditional love. I want to gather you who seek to kill me under my wing, nurture you, comfort you, protect you, not lash out at you. This is God's love for you embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. Going back to some of the writings from Isaiah, which also affirms some of what Julian of Norwich was writing. Here's God saying to Israel, For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out. I gasp and pant. God is the one who gives birth. Think about God birthing the world at creation. Think about the, the pangs, the angst, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. Think about how painful that was for God. Or when the world was saved through a flood. Think about that pain. Or when the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. I mean, when those waters closed in on the Egyptians, God created them too. God loved them, too. Think of the pain. This isn't just something to be thrown away of the Egyptians, right? It's with great pain. If, if you ever have experienced a Passover meal, and, and the, the uh, rabbi has the people dip their finger in the grape juice or the wine, and then go on to a napkin, so you're splattering the napkin, and they go through the ten plagues. They talk about it with regret, with great regret, that the Egyptians died behind the Israelites who were escaping to freedom. Not something to be taken lightly. Something we don't think as much about, probably because we don't spend as much time reading our Old Testaments, is 
God's birth pangs in delivering Israel from their captivity in Babylon. First of all, to see them go into exile and to remain there for a couple of generations before finally returning to the rubble of their beloved city to rebuild it. God must have gone through great pain watching that. And many of these scriptures are being addressed to this nation that has gone through such pain. God feeling it with them. God who gave them birth, not just making light of it. And of course, ultimately for us as Christians, the, the pain of God giving God's Son to die for the sins of the world. Isaiah 66, 9, Do I bring to the moment of birth and not deliver, says the Lord? Do I close up the womb when I bring to delivery, says your God? So I want to think about this, this word womb for a minute. So the, the Greek word for womb is uh, huster, transliterated H-U-S-T-E-R or H-Y-S-T-E-R as we would further amend it. So that's where we get the word like hysterectomy uh, because the womb is extracted. But it also has given rise to a couple of other words that are kind of on the sexist side. Like, you're acting hysterically, right? That means you're acting like somebody who what? Has a womb. So, uh, there, there, there's some, you know, back, you're acting like a woman, right? Uh, hysteria, that, that's a word with womb as its root. So, so, sometimes it's good to think about the meanings behind words, right? We, they, they might not mean what they used to mean, but uh, there's, there's still a connection. I, I think about the ups and downs of the joy of a mother holding and seeing her, her newborn, but yet then on the downside, you sometimes hear about people going through postpartum depression. And so again, both could be seen as emotions tied to having a womb. So God obviously is referring to God's self as being like one with a womb who carries us, who delivers us, who births us. But God also nurtures us and protects us like a mother. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. So think about women while they're pregnant and after they deliver. Careful about what they put into their body, careful about how they move, right? They're careful about their children when they're young and can't do a whole lot for themselves. They have to be fed, changed, clothed, bathed, put to bed. And I remember during our uh, older son Nathan's first year, Phyllis would wake up at night and say, go check and see if he's covered. Go check and see if he's feeling warm. Go check and see if He's still breathing, right? All these things. And, of course, the Lama's uh, childbirth classes, you know, with, you know, make sure you lay the baby this way or this way because sudden infant death syndrome, blah, blah, blah. And so you're thinking about that. And I wonder how many sleepless nights that has created in mothers just thinking about if they properly put their child into the crib. And of course, I remember Phyllis keeping diligent track of everything that the kids ate, whether they got enough of the right thing and not too much of the wrong thing, like pieces of rug, fur from stuffed animals, etc. 
remember one time our uh, Phyllis was mortified, our younger son, we were in a visitor center, and somebody had squished chocolate brownie into the rug, and take your eye off the kid for just a minute, and scraping it out, and out of the, oh, pretty gross. Yeah. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. So when, when children get hurt, right, is it the fathers that run for the boo-boo bunnies? The mothers, right? The boo-boo, let me kiss it and make it feel better. What's the father do? Here, it'll be better. Go on, you know. So be tough. It'll be better by the time you're married. You know, shake it off. But the the mothers are the ones who comfort when when children get hurt more often. I'm not saying that the roles aren't sometimes reversed. But God does agonize over God's children like a mother does from birth on, setting us free, but never fully letting go. God speaking in Isaiah 49 Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. I think about the mothers who agonize when their children don't do well academically or when their children are having behavioral issues or developmental issues or the sleepless nights when their children are out late with the car. Now, I was always home on time with the car because when I got home, even though it was past most people's bedtime, I was still on time because when I came in the house from the garage, there was my mother on the couch with one eye open, so I knew she'd be laying there awake till I got home. So, you know, if I, I was even a minute or two late, That was a minute or two longer. She'd be on the couch sleeping with one eye open. I think about mothers who agonize over their children's uh, choices and life partners, whether their children are living together before marriage, children who are experiencing brokenness in their marriage. I think about mothers agonizing over They're children who get involved in substance abuse or have employment issues or financial problems. Up to her dying day, my mother worried about her children. Now, granted, we were like in our 50s, you know, when when my mother died. Um, But she was particularly concerned about the youngest one, you know, the, the one with uh, ABD and biomedical physics from UCLA. She was so concerned about that one. You know, what is it about that maternal instinct that they raise children but can't fully let them go? When our older boy Nathan was 16 months old, he fell and broke his femur. He slipped getting out of the tub while he was drying off. He had to be in a body cast for quite a while. And I remember having a checkup with the pediatrician after the body cast came off. And she's like, is that one foot turned a little? Well, that's all Phyllis needed. That's all she could think about. He's going to grow up, you know, so that he walks like this, right? And it, it wasn't long after that that my, my parents were visiting, and Phyllis was expressing this concern to my dad, who, by the way, was an early childhood education specialist. And, you know, dad knew that Phyllis was anguishing over the possibility of a son, you know, who walks like this because of the broken femur. My dad goes, look at the bright side. If he decides to run away in the winter, you'll have no trouble tracking him in the snow. (laughs) 
I guess fathers don't anguish over these things. Mothers do, right? So a mother keeps a child close. I mean, they have for ages, right? We, we, we had our uh, friends Mishik and Agnes Katsidzira from Zimbabwe live with us uh, for a month when our kids were, would have, actually our, our younger one wasn't born yet. And I had been to Zimbabwe and admired how the Zimbabwean women can just grab the kid with one hand, put them there with the other hand, throw the blanket around, tie it on, and away they go. And Agnes was demonstrating this stuff. She goes, well, get me a blanket about this long, whatever. She takes her younger son, Nathan, boom, and it's like, wait a minute, you're supposed to spend... $400 on a Graco backpack where you have to adjust the straps, another feel. It's like, how did, how did we survive all these years, you know, without all these gadgets that you can buy for your new kids? I, I don't know. I mean, I guess they really struggled through all these generations and generations until we came up with uh, fancy things to buy for when your kids are little. But regardless, God keeps us close because we are vulnerable. A mother loves us for life, but God loves us more and for eternity. I hope that by considering some of these scriptures that might expand your understanding of God's love a little bit, that you consider God's birth pangs for you and God's joy over you. I pray that you can appreciate God's nurture and protection and that God's love will never let you or anyone go. Amen.
we would like to uh, celebrate with Jean Craig. She's having a birthday on Mother's Day and a special one too, 70, uh, I said 70, 97, right? You don't look a day over 50, but Jean, <laughs> happy birthday. <clears throat> Also want to uh, keep our community in prayer. If you've been following the York newspaper, you've been seeing just one shooting after another, three in one night recently. And I, I got to thinking and anticipating a Mother's Day. All these victims have mothers. All of these people with guns have mothers. So somewhere, relationships have gone terribly wrong. And if there's anybody who can perhaps contribute to the solution that would be the human relationship experts, the body of Christ. Uh, and we're human relationship experts, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus Christ is in us. I pray that we do not become numb to some of the things that we read about, I pray that we don't just become passive spectators, but that we agonize in prayer over God. How do we respond to this? Also, as, uh, as in general, Pennsylvanians seem to be uh, responding well to the COVID crisis, that's not such a happy story in other parts of the world. And in India, of course, we've been hearing on the news about how we're going to be sending vaccines over there. Um, they're, they're having, is there a picture of that to bring up? Fires on the streets because they, they just have to like get rid of the bodies that quick. And so there's a man who's running through the funeral pyres um, that's the picture that accompanied the article on the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, assuring us that UMCOR is doing their part to help out in India, working with the Christian Medical College of Bilor, as well as the Church's Auxiliary for Social Action. And you might know as well that the new General Secretary for UMCOR, the Board of Global Ministries, is from India, Roland Fernandez, about how UMCOR designated funds be used problem. And of course, dear friends, it's a global pandemic. We might think, well, we've got it together in our household or we've got it together as a state or even as a nation, but until we get a hold of this across the globe, uh, it's, it's going to have uh, ramifications that come back and affect us. So we, 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 need to think, we need to think like God who loved the whole world. So we, we need to make it our goal to do what we can to eradicate this virus throughout the world, not just in our neck of the woods. Shall we be in prayer? God of us all, you have fashioned the women who have been part of our personal histories, and you have given hope to those who have struggled alongside the men of history to fashion an age of hope and unity. We remember some of the women from Scripture, Miriam, sister of Moses and his shrewd and strong protectress, prophetess among the people, bard of the exile, leader through the wilderness. We remember Naomi, who could perceive your work even when it was not yet visible to others, and Ruth, yours by adoption from a foreign culture, a model to us of devoted love. We remember Mary of Magdala, who was healed by Christ and was the first witness 
to the miracle of the empty tomb. We are thankful for Lydia, Priscilla, Eunice, and Lois, women who helped to establish the early church and were its benefactors. We praise you for Teresa of Avila. We praise you for Juliana of Norwich, for Susanna Wesley, examples to all of spirituality and the exercise of freedom in their devotion to God. We remember Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, by whose faith and conviction many enslaved persons were brought to liberation. We are grateful for the women currently in our lives whom we name in our hearts before you, and for many other women unnamed. For all of these, we give you thanks, O oh God. Amen. Let us join together in praying our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, we're going to try something that we've done successfully before using this very same hymn tune. When we get to the fourth verse, if you're on the piano side, you just... Go right ahead and sing it like you're normally going to sing it. If you're on this side, give it a measure. I'll bring you in a measure after they start. So let's see if we can create this uh, two-part round on verse 4. So I invite you to stand. who birthed us by the Spirit, strengthens each one of you for ministry. The Lord, whose steadfast love is constant as a mother's care, sends us out to live and work for others. 
the blessing of Almighty God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer is with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.